All right. And welcome to the Randy Savage Show. You guys are here with me today. This is a solo episode, just friends and family. So welcome. Yeah, there's a lot, but there's a lot happening out there in the world right now, huh? A lot of stuff going on, I think. What is today? Today is the first, and that means that we have second, third, fourth, fifth. Four more days. Four more days until the election day. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the election day where we will be choosing a brand new president of the United States, the free world, right? District of Columbia, either Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. But the first thing I want to talk about was actually the first thing was Donald Trump, but not just him in the uh, political sense, but Donald Trump was on JRE. He was on the Joe Rogan experience. It was massive. Now, if you follow the JRE, you know that he's been like talking about talking to him for years now, you know, or not talking to him for some years. He'd go back and forth and whatnot, but it was really cool to finally see, see him sit down on the podcast. Number one reason it was really cool is because it was the first time Trump went over an hour. Like he's so right now he's like on a on a podcast campaign though right he's on flagrant it all started with him going on the Nelk Boys they took the Nelk Boys episode down he was on flagrant two that one got to stay up he was on uh, Theo Vaughn's this past weekend so he was do he was doing the rounds and he finally I don't know I I, I forget which podcast I heard him say it but he was like. He's like, I'll go, I'll go on, I'll go on Trump's show. Or I mean, he's like, I'll, I mean, I'll go on JRE's show, but he's got to invite me. We're not, we're definitely not going to ask. So he must have asked him. He must have heard that, asked him, got him on the show. And it was like three hours long. It was, um, it was a really long episode. It was cool to see Trump, like not squeeze into such a small period of time and to see him with actually no teleprompter, because that's really a thing that people... I feel like if people don't really remember, I mean, unless you're in the biz, unless you're in the biz, uh, the majority of the things that he's saying, not the funny stuff, not the stuff that you know a lot of people like or hate, but majority of the things that he's saying, he's just reading off of a teleprompter. He has, he literally has the exact same teleprompters that we use at Michigan Digital. It is, uh, it's a screen on the ground, and then there's a long black pole behind it, and then these like translucent mirror see-through mirror things i don't really know how to explain it but you got one on your left trump's got one on the right and he's just reading whatever they wrote for him mostly right and he does he does go off of the script a ton that's probably the biggest reason why people find him funny that's why i find him funny when he when he says the off the cuff stuff like sleepy joe biden and and uh, Crooked Hillary, all that stuff. It's hilarious. And that was actually what I thought was uh, fascinating about the Joe Rogan podcast episode with him. Like, even through that, he's so, he's so, like, dedicated to the brand that he still utilizes and uses all those things. Like, he, <laughs> like, one hour in, he's like, Sleepy Joe. Uh, hour and a half in, he's like, you know, he uses all the other ones. He's like, Crooked Hillary. And it's cool <laughs> to see that he stays on brand even when he's in a long, he doesn't, he doesn't miss a beat on that. But um, it was interesting. It was very interesting to see, like, how, how Joe would ask him questions. And he is like a master at deflecting the real answer right like if joe was like so what would you what would you rather have a cup of water or a pepsi he would give a 20 minute monologue on you know the the invention of pepsi and when pepsi really hit the market and then how bottled water was actually a scam and and not actually give the answer and i thought that was so sick I, and I really do mean that. Like, I really feel like, like as, uh, as an individual 
aspiring to speak for a living myself, it's really cool to see someone calmly uh, overstep answering questions that they don't want to answer. Maybe they don't have the right answer for them, you know? Uh, the biggest one that I saw was, that I thought was really cool, he hit him up about the JFK assassination. Because I guess Trump, it, it's a quote, he brought it up. He was like, you know, you said, if you saw what I saw in the JFK uh, files, then you wouldn't release them either. And he pressed them about that piece. He's like, yo, so what's up with the files? And Donald, Donny T, uh, he basically said the reason he did not release those files is because there are individuals living right now working in government still that are in those files tied to the illegal assassination of John F. Kennedy. And you know what ran through my head, though, at that moment, though, was like, isn't that more reason to release them? Isn't that more reason to release those files so then those names become public and then they're fired at minimum? If these people were behind the, the, the actual conspiracy that we know to kill John F. Kennedy, why are they still in our government? They should be gone. They should be, I mean, I'm not gonna say they should be public marks or public targets, but they definitely shouldn't be working in the government anymore. Go get a normal job. No mas, it's done, it's over. Go work at Burger King or whatever you can do. Go get a, a cushy job or something. But So that to me was not a great excuse. Like he's basically saying I'm protecting these horrible individuals. Like to me, I'm like, I don't feel like that's a good reason not to, not to show it, but that was cool. That was cool that he pressed him enough where he did actually get an answer. And also, I think it's funny because the whole time during the interview, he's really good at bringing up the negative things that the Biden administration has done. And also, I don't really know if they've done it or not. That's really my biggest thing. Like, here's the biggest one that I hear all the time is... uh the migrants, illegal migrants and at the border. And, I, and I'm really saying, I don't know if it's a gigantic problem one way or not. But in my personal life experience, like I'm not, I'm not running into any more migrant issues than I have in my entire life. Same migrant issues I had before, which aren't really that many migrant issues at all. Uh, I mean, I, when I was a construction worker, I worked with like all... Oh, Mexican guys from Zocatecas, they're all illegals. That, on a day-to-day -day basis, hurt my back more because they're the most extreme, athletic, work, hard-working people I've ever met. And, and, and I really do mean it. Like, I don't believe that uh, it was good for me. It really did annoy me. I, I hated that aspect. Because they're brought up, and this is the way that I saw it, at least at the time, you know, they're brought up in a country where they – that like if you're an american you're going to be softer than they are statistically most likely like they don't have labor laws they don't have to finish high school they can start laying block and brick i mean I, according to their own words when they're eight nine ten years old i think it was probably a little bit because those are heavy things to move around, but I could be wrong, and that could be why they're so proficient. But they'll work from 6.30 in the morning till 6.30 at night with a smile on their face, and they'll work twice as hard as me, and I hated it. But that hasn't gotten any worse since the Biden uh, administration. That's the same thing that I did. I mean, that was, that was actually during the Trump administration that I was working. Those illegals were there. So I don't experience it myself, but let's just say that it is happening and there is a huge, horrible migrant issue. Um, he kept bringing up that like, this is the Biden administration issue and they're eating the cats and they're eating the dogs. The only thing that I would have a problem with, cause again, I, I really can only go off what I'm experiencing or at least people around me, is if they're getting a bunch of free money. Because when it comes to getting free money, I want to get the free money. 
That's right, ladies and gentlemen. I want as much free money as they'll give me. I'm talking about grants. I'm talking about assistance. And I heard through the grapevine, so it could be all BS, that illegal migrants are coming to our country right now. I don't know exactly what they're doing. Maybe they like they say they run like straight to the border police or whatever, and the border police hook them up and just like you're asylumed or something like that. Bada bing, bada boom, they put them in a nice uh, hotel room. But once you're in this nice hotel room, then you get put in the system and you get some type of card, some type of debit card that has thousands of free dollars on it. And I think that it actually uh, gets reimbursed monthly. I'm not 100% sure, but if they're getting anything like that, that's what I'm against because I want it, not them. <laughs> but, but I really do truly mean that. And it was so interesting to see Donald Trump on the mic with Joe Rogan. Now, one of the biggest things, though, because like I felt like there was a lot of soft balls thrown at him. We got to remember that Joe Rogan is best friends with Dana White, who is best friends with Donald Trump. Donald Trump allowed Dana White to put on his UFC fights like way back in the day at Trump Towers or something like that, way before it was acceptable. Like now, viewers, kids, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, the UFC is a household name. Everybody knows the UFC now, but not too long ago, it was seen as some weird human like cockfighting, some extremely brutal, not okay to do on television type thing in a lot of places would actually turn down Dana White and turn down the, I forget their name, the Fatora twins or whatever, the guys that own it, and say, no, you can't put your promotion on here. You can't put your fight on here. And during that time, that's where they really solidify their connection to each other. So he's kind of sitting across the table from, a, you know, a friend. So everything was real soft. And Donald Trump is really good at bringing up that friendship all the time. Like, in such a goofy way, too. Like, he'll say it like this. He goes, you know Dana White? He goes, he goes, Joe, you know Dana, don't you, Dana White? Yeah, yeah, dude. You know he knows Dana White. Duh, what kind of question is that? And then Joe responds, yeah, well, I love Dana. We both love Dana. He's such a great person. So that, ha that mutual, like, connection, anytime he was throwing anything real hard at him, like, real, he seemed to just go into our friendship thing. He'd be like, Dana White's our mutual friend, or this guy, or that, and what a great aunt. And that piece of it, that piece of it, I'm gonna put it in my pocket for myself, actually. But I don't like watching it, and I see that it's just like an evasion tactic not to really deal with the hard pieces of the issues. Now, if I'm gonna give them any positive thing, though, like, one, th yeah, I, I, I got to give them all the positive. You know, I got to straw man the operation. One thing I did like is that he admitted to making like, you know, massive mistakes when it comes to who he chose as um, <clears throat> some of the people that you appoint. I know during one part of the interview, he was saying that <clears throat> as a president, you appoint 10,000 individuals in operation under the government but he did say that it's more like you appoint 10 individuals you appoint 10 and those 10 then deal with the appointing of 10 more i don't know it sounds almost like a like a ponzi scheme like a pyramid scheme of some sort but uh he admitted that he chose the wrong people and i like that i like when a world leader or an aspiring one we don't know if he's gonna win when a world leader will admit his faults and his fallacies. I think that it's a very smart thing to do. And when you don't do that as a politician, you're actually harming yourself. And the reason is, is because all humans make mistakes. Every single human does. Like, so when you try to make yourself look unfallible, it's an instant red flag in a normal person's brain. Red alert, red alert, he's lying. You know, you, there's no way that you could have done everything as perfectly and fantastically as possible. It's not possible. We all make mistakes, and some of those mistakes were on your end. That was cool for him. Cool to see him do that. And uh, also, it was cool to see Joe basically say, like, now, like, Kamala can come on next, you know? And it's 
crazy to me that Kamala didn't go on. Like, this is the moment where I feel like you got to come on. You must come on, especially because you're you're presenting yourself in the media as like more the people's person. You're like for for the poor person or whatever. I don't know. I get I get one ad every single day. It's the same ad every day. And it's like uh, it starts out where it's like. If you're rich, then Trump is your guy. And then it's a little sound bite of Trump going, we're going to we're going to be rich as hell. And then it's like for everybody else. And it changes the music up to give you an emotional, different response. It's like and for everybody else, if you're a normal person, then Kamala Harris is going to cut taxes for you and this and that. It's that one over and over and over. So if you're the people's champ, you know, Mala, Mama Kamala. If you're the champ of the people, you should definitely go on the biggest show chosen by the people. Even if you're going to mess it up, make mistakes. You Let's say, like, I would, even if you would have only gave him an hour, lie. Why don't you just lie? Tell Joe, yeah, I'll do it for three hours. I'll do five hours. And then give him whatever you give him. But not showing up after being invited and then trying to get him on his dime to come out to where you guys were to interview at the CNN, like at the CNN air uh, place for only an hour. Come on, dude, get out of here. That's not what a podcast is. And you're missing the point. The po a podcast is raw. A podcast. It has the mistakes. It has the beautiful moments, but what it doesn't have, right. Is, talking points, uh, cut sections, uh, have everybody in a Zoom meeting area where you're like, all right, everybody, and just know you're going to have a five-minute five, five minute speaking ability, and then we're going to cut to the next part. No, nah, dude, that's not a podcast. That is produced television. So it makes sense for Joe to obviously deny you there, but why would you deny him? Like you have full agency at the end of the day. You could cut the mic. You could walk away. Oh, I'm sorry, my beard. Oh, I have a little fuzz in my beard. Sorry, guys. I think I have a little fuzzy. Did I have a fuzz in my beard? Yes, I did. I did. I did. But you have full agency. You could just lie, say you're going to do whatever he wants, and then do whatever you want. Simple. Very simple. And most likely, at least according to how Joe Rogan talks about himself, he's just going to air it, not going to cut it. You could have presented any way you wanted, but you denied it. And when you denied it, it makes me feel like you can't handle it. And I don't want to feel like my president can't handle going on a podcast. That's really my biggest thing. Like, I don't care either way. I think you're both pretty dumb from what I'm looking at. From what I've seen, Trump ain't made no real money. Unless it was made off of previous business arrangements and finalized by his father. So you're not really like this business savvy, like dude that you present or whatever. So, so I really don't care that much. I'm saying if he was, then I probably would choose him uh, more because money is the motivation. And I loves the money. No, I'm kidding. I don't love money, but money is a security and money is a... It's an important part of the society that we live in. This is a capitalist society, a dollar for a service, a dollar for a good. And that's kind of why I would push towards that way. But when I actually researched it, I was like, oh, you didn't make no money. Like, what did you actually make or produce? The biggest thing I know of really is that show that you had where you went, you fired. And I know how shows work. There's a hundred people behind the scenes really making that happen. You didn't really do it. You know what I'm saying? I don't even know if you had that idea. I'm sure the network probably had the idea for you and came to you. But Kamala, if you can't handle going on a podcast, how are you going to handle negotiations with Putin? How are you going to handle negotiations with GG Ping? How are you going to handle TikTok slanders. Now, here's my biggest thing. I I feel like I'm being still a little biased because she did go on Call Her Daddy. 
I think Call Her Daddy is a show that is only an hour long always. And I haven't watched it. So maybe she did really good on there is what I'm saying. Maybe she was witty. She was cunning. She was baffling. She talked about the policies. Um, I don't know. But a little problem I have is that, like, Donald Trump will make me laugh like a comedian. Like, he'll set up, punchline, follow through, and I laugh. I don't get a lot of that from Kamala. I get a lot more me laughing at her failing, which is okay. Because I like when comedians do that, too. Uh, but most people don't. And it's supposed to be laughing with you, not laughing at you, I think. I'm still mixed up on all that personally. I kind of like to get them to laugh at me. I like being the butt of the joke. And then I also want them to laugh with me. But I like when I am the facilitator of getting laughed at. But I still need to watch that episode. I got to, and, and I don't really like Call Her Daddy because all they talk about is sex and basically just sex. It's really annoying. But I do want to give it a chance because who am I to say until I see it? I haven't even seen a clip from it. I don't know how she did there. She could have been fantastic. But I'll tell you what has been fantastic. Her commercial push to change the narrative has been amazing. I mean, I don't even know how it happened because like, I don't remember what year it is. I'm not the best. It all kind of blurs. Maybe it was 2018. I think it was before Trump was in office. I don't remember. But there was a debate between Tulsi Gabbard and Kamala Harris. And in that debate, I think it very much highlighted the biggest issue that Kamala Harris has. And honestly, I feel like my mom has this issue pretty badly as well, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, she will she'll, she will talk on an issue that she doesn't know anything about, but she knows how to float through a conversation. But if you're a person who understands the issue, you'll call that out real quick. So like, I'm not even saying that it's a bad thing to be able to do. I think it's really good to do like maybe in business meetings a lot of times to be able to kind of float through it and not even fully understand the mechanism, what it is. But she tried to do it with Tulsi Gabbard and Tulsi just annihilates her in the moment. She, I think she tries to call, I forget, uh, I forget exactly what it is, but it's something to do with not being a good military person or wanting more war maybe is what it was. But Tulsi just cuts right into her like a knife. Is like, you know absolutely nothing about me or my two terms of service in the military because she, she, she is a military service woman. She extensively understands war and doesn't want it. That's the biggest thing. And, and I feel like in that moment, if you, it's, only, it's only maybe like three minutes long, two minutes long. Maybe I'll be able to find it. Maybe I'll edit it in for you guys. Maybe I won't. I don't know. Why don't you guys leave it in the comments below? Should I edit in that little snippet, that two minutes of that are back and forth, or should I not? You guys can uh, leave it in the comments below. But it really highlights the problem that people bring up about Kamala Harris a lot. She's just like a code switcher. She's just presenting very well for the moment, but she doesn't have all the information, and it really shows a lot, like, when she's like, you better thank a union worker. And she's got her black voice on. And then when she's around a bunch of white people, she's like, you now must thank a union worker. She's old English with it. And, and honestly, I, and I swear to God, like I've seen, I've literally seen my mother, my own mother do that type of thing many, 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 many times. I used to call it her white voice on the phone. But also, here's another thing. I don't know what it's like growing up you know, as a black woman in those eras like Kamala Harris or like my mom. I don't know why they uh, choose to do or what motivated it. And it could be something that's not silly. But coming from the angle, you know, of 2024, it is silly to speak in any other manner than just the manner that you speak in. You know, if you're because because you're playing a character, <laughs> you know, you're literally playing a character at that moment. And trust me. I think there's backfires on that because I hear ladies from the hood talking real, real bonnexy, and I can't even understand them. 
and it's annoying to me. And they're tra- and they're kind of following what I just said. Like you don't have to do. That's kind of a problem with what it is right now. But if you don't speak good English, I think you should learn good English, and then uh, you should want to learn the the language that you speak better, even if you speak it well. I'm constantly reading, and when I'm reading, I'll come across a word that I don't know. And then I'll stop and I'll look up on dictionary.com that word. And then that word is now immersed into my language, you know, like, so I don't really understand what about, about be talking like that. It's actually quite annoying to me, but that is really, that is the issue that we run into when it comes to mama mala. And that's the issues that we run into when it comes to uh, Donnie T, Donald Trump. You know, he is an ev- he is an evader of the hard questions, and he's very good at it. So it's not like he's not going to show up to the fight, but he's, you know, he's going to slip every punch. The biggest issue when it comes to her, she's a code switcher. She presses through when she doesn't have the information. It would be better for, uh, you know, Miss Kamala Harris to, at the moment of not understanding something, to go, well, wait a minute, actually. I'm sorry, but I do not have the accurate information on that. I don't think I can accurately speak on it. Yo, I'm telling you, people would be, we would be blown away because it's so much better than the cackle answer deflect. The cackle answer deflect it looks so non genuine in a world where, you know, genuality is. I don't even know if that's a word, but <laughs> being genuine is is a thing that's valued a lot, especially with the younger culture. The more genuine you are, I mean, they might hate you. You know, they might hate what your genuinity is, but being genuine is respected and it's valued in today's culture. So, I, I mean, that's really the the biggest thing, and I am oh so very excited to see who the winner is. Because <laughs> to be real, because a lot of people say stuff like this, they're like, Oh, I made more money when Trump was in, and now everything is more expensive. I'm not that kind of guy. Like I, I truly feel like I can adapt to any system, basically. And I feel like I did very well under this uh, democratic system. I was just, I was actually just telling my, uh, the, my producer before I started. You know, I just received four thousand dollars in a technical assistance program that I'm pretty proud of. Pretty proud of myself because I didn't have a grant writer. I didn't have anyone help me at all except for AI, me and AI countless nights of me and AI writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting and rereading over the requirements needed. But those are like implementations of the left, you know, government assistance, uh, grant programs to help artistry, um, artistic endeavors. Those things really are supported mostly by like Democrats and the left. And I got to the money here. I got to the money you know, under the Biden administration, I got to the money under the Trump administration. I've been kind of broke under both of them too in certain periods. So it's, and to me, it's just, I don't feel that like one is better than the other. I think they're both messed up. Like, I think that, uh, that people, people are just kind of weaker overall in America now. I was thinking about, I was actually, I was driving my sister to the airport this morning. She's going to Chicago. And when I was driving her there, she was telling me about this guy that she used to talk to or whatever. And uh, like, he hasn't worked in 23 years because he hurt his hand and because he's bipolar. So I don't exactly know what's wrong with his hand, but I do know that I used to see guys with hook hands old cats that got their hands cut off and stuff like that. Like my grandpa is so much stronger than your weak hand is kind of what I'm saying. And it's really like apparent, like bro. And then, and then, um, cause I, cause I don't really know. Right. Cause I can only live in my mental experience. Your bipolar disorder. Like, I really don't like, I really just don't like to hear men say that. Like, I, like, I don't want to hear, a person who is supposed to be a provider biologically at minimum, but you also say you're supposed to be a provider, say that you have some type of internal mechanism issue 
that you can't prove and I can't prove because I just have to assume that I can't trust you now or like you're just a weak person or this or that. So that overall kind of seems to be a normality in our society today. Like it's almost a currency in being weak. Like, ah, it's so weird. Like, my brain automatically, instantly when I say weak, I'm like, don't say that. Like, I'm even saying in my head, don't call them weak. Because, you know, I've been conditioned to believe if someone has a mental illness, I, I really do believe this too, because I've been conditioned, I think, though. If someone has a mental illness, they need help. And that you should be more gentle with the person. But also at that exact same time, I don't see no blood tests for their mental illness. There is no metric and measurement of a chemical imbalance in their brain. Literally, the sick person comes to the doctor and they say, I got this issue. And it's of the mind. And then the doctor has to listen to the mentally ill person's diagnosis, their symptoms. Like, if I can't trust that your mind is good, right, you're he we're here to prove that you have a bad mind, how can I even trust that what you're telling me is good information? And that's kind of why, at least me personally, I feel like I'm not saying one is better than the other. I think that maybe there should probably be more of a beautiful blending of both. But, you know, our nation was built on the backs of strong men. And sometimes strong men work really, really hard and they'll make easy times. And easy times then will breathe weaker men, <laughs> you know, cause they grew up in an easier era. And I, and I'm literally talking about like myself compared to my dad, you know, and, uh, so on and so forth, you know, the younger generations in my family, majority of them, I find them to be weaker. And it, and it, it really has to do, I think with that concept that strong men build, you know, the great times and then the great times produce the weak men. And then that's where we are on the precipice maybe now. We have all these weak people that are going to now create bad times because <laughs> the weak people make bad times again. And then the next gen hopefully will fix it. But that truly is how I feel about Kamala and Trump. But in other news, Young Thug released from prison. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, YSL, if you're a fan of the hip hop culture, which most of the people who watch this, we likes our rap. It looks to be that Young Thug is either set to be released or has actually been released. There's, you know how the internet is. There's conflicting things on both sides. So I saw the judge actually stating that he is to be sentenced to Time served, because I think he's been in jail for maybe three, three or prison for three years now. I'm not sure. It's It's been a while. But he's got time served, and he's looking at 20 years probation. So in Michigan, that is considered, because he's a different state. In Michigan, that's considered lifetime probation. They give you lifetime probation, which is approximately 10 to 15 years of supervised drug testing. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot of work. It's like kind of being a little bit of locked up while you're not locked up. But obviously, as long as the money's right, then you there, there's great workarounds for the type of lifestyle that Young Thug has, uh, you know, garnish, adopted, and shown forth. Uh, he's rich, right? He's a rich dude. So if you're rich and you have good doctors, you have good insurance, you have good lawyers and stuff like that, while he's out on lifetime probation... Because if you know Young Thug, then you know that he's infamous for his drug use. And some might even say abuse. But definitely his drug use. Sipping lean, popping perkies, getting high, um, spending lavish amounts of money on clothes. He's very into fashion, drugs, and open about it. So if you have the right type of insurance, right type of doctors, then you can be prescribed to the probably the narcotics, that, any narcotics that you do deem desirable. And um, it's very interesting, though, because these moments, I feel like at least expressed through rappers in previous times, 
you know, rappers get out and they really think they're just free, free. They're free to live their life and just be what it is. And they're really definitely not. And that that is actually being shown with 6 9 who just days ago was arrested for violating his bond agreement. Like when you're on probation, when you're on bond and you're out in the free world, you're still owned by the correctional facility. By definition, you are. You are still of property. You still have that number. Anyone can look you up online and see that number. That number is their currency claiming you as a prisoner. And the second you violate any of those outside world terminology, like you're out in the world, but they have all these rules. If you, if you break them, then you go back to prison. Like that's literally how it works. Maybe not. Sometimes you might just do some uh, time in jail as they decide what they're going to do. They might just throw you back out. A lot of times they'll even give you three times to violate. But you better watch your P's and your Q's is what I'm saying. Because these these charges that they that you guys are getting away with, and when I say you guys, I'm saying like 6 9 6 9 got off by uh, snitching, but it was a RICO charge with murder involved. These, these, these murder charges, they don't have statutes of limitations. They hold a life sentence behind them. They have minimum requirements where even if the judge wanted to let you out, they would then be breaking the law to do so. Like, you got to follow your P's and Q's. And it's interesting because I guess the question is going to come down, you know. Is Young Doug going to be able to follow these things? And I don't know. Most of them can't. NBA Young Boy, you know, he was signed on a 30. It's the biggest. It's the biggest contract that uh, an independent artist was ever signed for at the time. $36 million, NBA young boy, he receives the money, he's out on conditional bond, breaks it. The dude's got to serve four, I think four years now. Like, you only got a shelf life of so long. You know, my friend OZ, he kind of says it like this. He's like, yo, if you're locked up 10 years or more, it's over. You don't get more than 10 years locked up as you could be the biggest rap artist. If you're gone more than 10 years, we're going to forget about you. And he said, uh, you know, he brought up Boozy. He's like, you know, Boozy did it in seven. But if you look at all the other rappers, they always get out in way shorter periods of time, thus keeping them valid. Look at Lil Wayne. I think Lil Wayne only did two years in prison. You know, you got to keep it less than 10 because that's a whole generation that's going to be not knowing who you are. They're not going to know who you are. They're going to be on to the new things, and you're not going to have a social significance strong enough to matter when you get out. But then I brought up the release of Big Meech. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Two giants in the industry. Big Meech, the original BMF, has now been released from prison. He is back in Detroit. And if you guys don't know Big Meech, or of him, he was a notorious drug kingpin out of Detroit. And he, I forget who the rappers were even, I can't even remember, but BMF was some type of rap group. And what he did is that he funded, you know, this rap career of these, I think it's other individuals, and then he would launder his cocaine and his heroin money through there. And it was, you know, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. The amount of money he made is why he got such a crazy significance. But, you know, he was locked up a long time ago, actually. I think they locked him up in 2002, maybe even 2013. I'm not sure, but locked up a long time ago. His son, though, becomes a pretty culturally important individual while he's locked up, thus bringing him back up, right? They drop a huge documentary on him. Then his son becomes culturally important. And then they drop BMF the show. And if you're black watching my show, you know BMF the show. It's a show that I think was uh, produced by 50 Cent. It's kind of like that show Power, but it's all about Big Meech. And the person who plays Big Meech in the show is his biological son. That just came out like after COVID. So this man has been able to keep a social significance 
through his entire 25 year sentence. He did 25 years in prison. Still looks great though, you know what I mean? Black don't crack and kept take take care of himself all fit. But um he probably has a good path of, you know, becoming an entertainer of some types of becoming socially important somewhere start a podcast live become a streamer i don't know you know what i mean twitch uh kick but it's interesting because he is a person who really broke that concept he broke that theory of oz's that you know you can only be locked up for 10 years and still hold your full like social Providence, your importance. And I think that's that's pretty pretty cool of him. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is this. In America today, we are too many crybabies. And I'm one of us. I'm a big crybaby myself. A lot of wah, wah, I want, I want. And I mean, it works for me in a lot of ways, but also it works against me in a lot of ways. And most of you are lazy crybabies and listen to me. Hard times, they make hard men. Those hard men make easy times. Then those times, dudes like me, be raised in, thus creating easy men, weak men. And what we do is we create, we create messed up times. And that's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Wrap it up.